Uh, morning I'm going to speak on a topic which I have titled The God Who Speaks. And uh, it's it's very, very profound to know that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, in the beginning, God spoke. And in the book of Revelation, it ends with God speaking again. God wants to speak into the context of our lives if we are willing to listen. That's important. And every one of us lives at a different measure of busyness. People are running one direction, going for this, going for that, and, and uh, like we live in a hurried world, there is no doubt about it. What was 20 years ago wasn't 10 years ago, and what was 10 years ago isn't in the context of today. And there is a danger that in our busyness, we can unconsciously put, push God out of our lives. You can do your devotions from a point of hurry. Just want to read your morning devotion because you made a commitment and, and you think God is going to knock you on the head and knock your block off if you don't do it. And so you read it and you finish and you get on with your life. God speaks in John chapter 10, 27 to 28. My sheep hear my voice. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, God speaks from a position of light. The Bible says the earth was without form and darkness was upon the face of the earth. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good and he divided day from night. Darkness and light cannot coexist. One will try to always push out the other. And this morning, we have to allow the light of God's word to penetrate our hearts. The Bible says that God knows the thoughts and intents of the hearts of men. The word of God is more powerful than a two-edged sword piercing asunder to the bone and to the marrow. Can't get more specific than that. God wants to communicate to us on a constant basis. The Bible also says in times past God spoke through the prophets and in visions and dreams. But now He speaks through His Son, the Word. And there is a security in the world. I just watched a few days ago a, a very famous Western speaker, I won't name the person, who, who, who had the courage to say, my teaching, well known, well known, very well known. Speaker who said, well, I say, my teaching on faith and prosperity was imbalanced. And I thought, wow, coming from that person, that was a great admission of failure. Better late than never. The Berlian Christians checked out what Paul preached. We are called to preach light so that darkness can be dispelled. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God looked at the light and he said, the light is good. So this morning, I want to talk to you from the lives of three people. And maybe there could be some area of your life where you need an impartation of God's revelation to take you from where you are to where he wants you to be. God's purpose is always progressing. But unfortunately, many people stagnate spiritually 
because they have no personal development plan for their lives. Where do you want to be at the end of the year? We make a lot of resolutions and, and they say 90% of the people who make resolutions don't keep them. So you do it next year. But you got to have a determination to stay committed to your development. Somebody else can't do that for you. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get out of your country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Wow. The God who speaks. God was setting a direction for Abraham's life. A direction that would not just change his life, but our lives also. There is a principle that you can latch on to. Your choices and mine have the power not only to affect us, but affect those connected to us. God is depending on you. He can use the angels, but he chose to use the human agency to propagate his divine will, purpose and plan on this earth. Nothing in our lives happens by accident. And God was telling Abraham, I am going to bless you in order that you can live a life beyond yourself. That's important. That's important. When we think of blessing, we just ask the question, what's in it for me? We live in a day and age and a culture called the millennial generation that lives selfishly. World missions in the assemblies of God is going down because a generation that used to give who were born before 1946 are passing away. And the younger generation by nature are very selfish. But the challenge of blessing is for me to live a life of generosity. And generosity has nothing essentially to do with money. It's an attitude. And God is telling Abraham, the destiny I have for a nation is dependent on your willingness to be obedient to the direction I set for your life. Wow! You know, it's, it's very interesting. When you do some research, the place that God spoke of Canaan would be a place where the gospel would penetrate to three continents because the Romans built roads to take the message there. That sort of just blows your mind. That everything God has purposed for our lives to the very minutest detail has been mapped out in the mind of God but it's dependent on our willingness to partner with him to fulfill it. My obedience guarantees blessing not just for me, but is designed to go beyond. And it's interesting. 
that Abraham's journey had to be a journey of faith and obedience, even when it didn't make sense to be obedient. When Jesus, in John chapter 4, went through Samaria, I don't think in his humanity he fully understood the direction that God the Father was setting on his life. But he went, he's a Jew. Jews don't associate with Samaritans because they were less than people. But it's funny that the first revival didn't happen in the book of Acts. It happened in a Samaritan village because one woman who had five husbands, God knows how she managed the five, then some of us can't manage the one we have. Choose to be obedient. That's the first revival. It's not the Acts revival that is first. That's the first revival. The village came to Christ before Pentecost. So don't limit your worldview on an assumption that might sometimes be wrong. God wants to use every one of us to reach out to somebody who could be disadvantaged in life. The power of one. Power of one. We look at multitudes, but God looks at one. If you can be a catalyst to be used by God to change one life, you have made a difference. The Bible says heaven rejoices when one person gets saved. So Jesus walked, I think uh, it, it's about 70 kilometers. You've been there last week, you know. It's a long walk in about a 50 degree temperature. Probably. And it says, how do you know, winter, summer, he was weary from the journey. But there was a woman at the well there. That's not my thing. But it says, Abraham took Lot with him. And here is where sometimes it can get challenging. The journey to destiny requires that we choose our relationships wisely. Abraham made a decision to go and his obedience was great. But he may have thought, you know, there are going to be some challenges out there. And so in order to help me manage those challenges better, I'll take Lot with me. But Lot got in the way of the divine purpose and plan of God for Abraham's life. So you would ask yourself the question as I constantly ask myself the question. Because for every move of God in your life, you can be sure the enemy has a counter move. to frustrate the plan of God. And when you read that, it's just a casual mention. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken and Lot went with him. And as a consequence in Genesis 13, there was tension in their lives. Lot wasn't part of God's plan for Abraham's life. You know, we got to be careful who attaches to us.
going to attach to people who can add value to my life. Spiritually speaking. Not material. Because I'm constantly on a learning curve. And I want to learn from somebody who has gone further down the road in the journey of life than me so I can learn. There are three ways we learn. One is we learn from our own mistakes and that's painful. Another way is we learn from somebody else's mistake. And the third is we don't learn from either. Lot represents a man who chose to live at a lesser level of spirituality. His focus was on the wrong things. You and I have the power to determine how far and how long we allow people who are counterproductive to our destiny to journey with us. Deuteronomy 10, 22, verse 10 says, you can't don't yoke an ox and an ass. It's a very profound statement. You can't know you an ox and an ass. Abraham, as he journeyed, built altars. Verse 4, verse 7, verse 13. Why did he build altars? The significance of an altar in the Old Testament was very important. An altar was a place of, defined as a place of communication. It was a place where he discovered the mind of God for the next step of the journey. Now you and I are going to face challenges in 2019, whether we understand it or not. That's not a lack of faith, that's just reality. I was talking to somebody this morning about the process of losing weight and, and doing push-ups and push-downs and I said at our age we better be careful how we manage our bones because in the process of reducing weight we might dislocate the joint. That's reality because the bones we have today are not like they were when we were 25 years old. So if you are going to do those things, get a professional to supervise you. This is dangerous. So God speaks to Abraham. And Abraham has to make a choice. Genesis 13, verse 8. And Abraham said unto Lord, Let there be no strife, I pray, between you and me, between your herdsmen and mine. Wow. You know what happens when there's a fight? Everybody joins in. Christians also fight. They do it in the name of Jesus. Many, many, many years ago, I spoke on Philippians about two ladies in the church in Philippi who couldn't get along. They were co-workers. Uh, they were Paul's intercessors and they were having a fight. And, and one lady who happened to be uh, there that morning told me, I could have hidden under the chair. How did we know we had a fight? I said, I didn't want that. Don't turn disagreements into feuds. That's the principle. That's the principle. And this tension wouldn't have happened if Lot didn't come along in the first place. So Abraham has to make a choice. And it says after. Verse 14. After the Lord had spoken, had separated Abraham and Lot 
God spoke to him and said, Lift up now the eyes and look from where you are, north, south, east, west, all this land is yours. So sometimes, if we are connected to the wrong people and we listen to the wrong voices, we can live a less than life. And I understand Abraham's predicament. He's an Eastern. Family is important to him. But God's plan was unique to Abraham. As God's plan is to you. And to me. And in our willingness to listen, God can communicate. 14,000 times in the Bible God speaks. And you're going to ask yourself the question this morning. Is there some impediment to my progress because of some relationship that has attached to me that I need to detach from? So I can start hearing the voice of God. You can't make everybody happy. Don't try. When God calls you, He often does it alone. And what God wants to accomplish in your life is unique to you. And I know we need to get sounding boards to make sure you know we're in the right direction. All that is, is, is part of the process. But ultimately and finally, God can speak with clarity because He's God. But Lot had attached himself to Abraham and then God caused him to make a choice. God doesn't make the choice for him. And after Abraham makes the choice, God speaks again. And once again, He doesn't work. So as you look at 2019, Look at your relationship circle intently and you and I might have to do some disconnects. We can't hang on to things that hold us back. We got to disconnect. If it has to be done, we do it. I have had to narrow my relationship circle so I can accomplish more. I can't have it both ways. And I did it. It was painful. But there are some people I've had to detach from. Because I'm going one direction and they are becoming a distraction to my life. Lot became a distraction. If you want to fulfill God's ultimate purpose, then you want to make choices. And you want to let go of the things that God wants you to let go of. He will make the decision for us. And then he'll speak to you again. Verse 17, and I walk through the land, the length, the breadth of it, I will give it to you. And Abraham removed his tent, and once again, verse 18, it is an altar. Number two, if you want to know God's direction for 2019, you better make a decision today to have a personal altar and time of personal communication with God. When you shut everything out and let God speak. He wants to. And if you are sensitive enough to listen and God wants to speak to you about you, not about somebody else, so don't worry about the next person. My role in life is not trying to correct somebody else's lack of spirituality. I'm not the fourth person in the Trinity, although I might like to think I am something. I remember a lady, it's always the lady, so not trying to be anti feminist or whatever. But I remember long ago in the church in Sri Lanka, a lady came and told me, 
you know, the guys don't care anyway, they don't listen, so it's all right. Uh, Pastor, I wish Sister so and so was there. So I'm like, that message was for her. I said, no, no, it's for you. It's for you. You ain't listening. When God speaks to you, don't pass it on. And all the men said, <laughs> you got to go home for lunch, so be careful. God wants to speak to you personally, not to your husband. Not to your husband. He has the power and capacity to speak directly to him. He wants to speak to you. He wants to bring some adjustments into your life. Be ready to listen. And all the ladies said, no, that's good. Once again, all the ladies said, at least a bit better than that. Some are frowning, some are staring. It's your problem. It means you have a problem. There was an emotional bonding that Abraham had with Lot. You got it. But it has to be. The second time God speaks that I want to draw attention to is in the book of First Kings, chapter nineteen. In First Kings, chapter nineteen, God speaks to a prophet who went through discouragement. And God says, put a stop to what's stopping you. Elijah was moving in the power of the Spirit. He was performing miracles. And then he listened to the wrong voice again. Voices. My sheep hear my voice. And he listened to the wrong voice. And he runs under into a wilderness and he sits under a broom brush tree and he wants to die. And so some of you might be sitting here this morning and you might be going through a time in your life or a season where you are vulnerable emotionally and things pull you down rather than lifting you up. Then this is for you. And we all go through it. Elijah had an expectation that God would work in a predictable way. He's preaching the message of repentance and people are not responding. So he is discouraged. When we allow discouragement to enter, enter our spirits, we lose sight of our purpose. We lose our sense of direction. We lose our sense of destiny. You see, Discouragement is an emotion, so it's very difficult to deal with. Because it's internal. External health issues are easy to deal with. It's the internal ones that are challenging. I know, I can write a book on discouragement. But each morning I made a decision. I am not going to allow whatever happens today to bring discouragement into my spirit. It's a daily decision. When I wake up, like First Samuel 30, David did, I encourage myself serving the Lord. So I become my greatest cheerleader. And I'm free. I have a freedom in Christ that nothing negative, nothing critical can take away from me. But it took me a while to come to that point. I do my part, God does His. I don't worry about anybody else. Elijah says, okay, I am left. Not true. I'm the only one who shows up on time. Now if you function in a team setting, in office, in a in a church setting, in a ministry setting, you can let them set the course and direction of your life. I don't allow that. I don't 
don't allow somebody else's lack of excellence get into me. That has been a learning goal. Some of us, by nature, we work in excellence. We just work with excellence. And when you are like that, you wired that way, somebody's lack of excellence can get into you. And that's a dangerous place to be. But I realize God is accountable, a God who is be accountable for my life and somebody else for theirs. Elijah functioned in isolation. And people who live isolated lives are more vulnerable to discouragement. That is why we have what is called life groups. I'll be talking about more, more of that on, 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 on the following Sunday. You, you need to connect to some body of people because you can't function alone. We think we can. The Bible says, God's, Psalm 60, God says the solitary in families. Family is God's idea. Not ours. So the Lord speaks to Elijah. And there are some lessons here. Number one, you might get discouraged from some at some point in time, but don't stay there. Put a stop to what's stopping you. Number two, you might be sitting here this morning and think your life has no purpose because of your struggles. Struggles are part of destiny. You can't avoid them. Jesus couldn't, Paul couldn't, neither can you. But faith in God can cause us to walk past those struggles and challenges and finish what God has started in you. That's it. You all get discouraged. But don't stay there. God has determined a sphere of influence for you. But when you get discouraged, you move out of the sphere of influence and you go into the sphere of concern and everything else around you looks down. And you lose sight of your purpose. It's just amazing. And if there is one thing that can neutralize a born again spirit filled believer is the emotional discouragement. The road to Christianity is littered with bodies of people who have got dissolution with their faith because God didn't come through the way they expected. They didn't stay in the path. Trusting God to eventually come to it. Ecclesiastes 3.11 He makes all things beautiful in his night. Don't believe anything less. Because that's in the Bible. And that is not preached often enough. Unfortunately. We think God is a get rich quick scheme. It doesn't work like that. Some of you are successful in life and you made it and it's only because 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration. I like the young guy long, long ago in Sri Lanka said, I said, do you prepare a message on Sunday? No pastor, when I get on the platform, I'll open my mouth, God will fill it. I said, God will fill it with hot yam. He'll put the words in your mouth. Yeah, you must know the word to put the words in your mouth. Otherwise, you'll have an empty mouth. I don't know where they get this theology from. Remember, theology is the study of God and the understanding of God. It's not some neutron on the planet. You are excited? I am. Discouragement is a choice, it's an emotion. If you allow your emotions to shape your life and envelope you and consume your energy, you will never end up in the place God designed you. 
You know, after this story, no more miracles. No. He lived a less than life. And God said, raise up a young guy called Elisha. He was plowing, you know, with his oxen. And, and uh, I'm going to replace him. We are disposable. If you and I don't do the job we are destined to do, God will raise up somebody else to do it. But God is a God of grace. God is a God of grace. He knows our limitations. And Elijah is returning in the end times as one of the two witnesses to preach the second time. So God is a God of grace. And God sent an angel to encourage a weary prophet. There's a scripture in Galatians which says, Do not be weary in well doing. Stay the path, don't faint. You will receive a reward. I want to ask myself, is it worth it? Is it worth it? It is. It is. You and I are in this for the long haul. We must not get tired of doing good for we will reap at the proper time if we don't. And you know what I have learned experientially? The greatest demonic attack on your life is just before your breakthrough. So you want to break out of your depression. We got to call out depression for what it is. It's real. Can Christians get depressed? Yes. It's nothing to do with your spirituality. Moses got depressed and wanted to die. Jeremiah, the greatest prophet. Next to Isaiah, got depressed and wanted to die. Elijah wanted to die. It's a state of inner being. It's an emotional thing. And sometimes we don't know how to medicate it. Sometimes we just need to get professional help. Because all depression has a root cause. And professionals can tell you what's wrong. Whether they are Christian, counselors, or medical staff. But we come to this worldview falsely that if you get discouraged, you are not spiritual. That's further from the truth. But don't stay discouraged. Seek help. Because today in the modern world, help is there. This point in life, there was no help. That's why God had to send an angel. Discouragement has nothing to do with our spirituality. And we got to put a stop to our stopping us. Wow. So I want to challenge your mind. What makes you discouraged? You know, I've known some of you well enough, long enough, I can tell when you are discouraged. But in some people I can see a state of continual discouragement. And that's sad because that's not the will of God. Because something happened in your early life experience or something happened in the journey of life and you are allowing the power of that negative thing to come true. I had to grow up without a father. And that is medically and, and emotionally one of the most painful challenges of life. But I had to come to a point when I said enough is enough. I had to tell my father, you have power over my life for this long, I'm taking the power back. <coughs> and I took it back. Then I started living different. There's a whole emotion in my life 
in one city, so I'm right, I can feel it. If you let me, Colossians 2 verse 10, you are complete in him and the word complete and his God fills the hollows and emptiness in our life by his grace. There's a book I have uh, in my room which says, I am not my father. Of a young man who was abandoned by his father who became one of the greatest preachers in the United Kingdom. So God can take what is negative and make something out of it because of grace. So the Lord spoke to Elijah in a still small voice. 12, 13, 14. And the one thing is like in the earthquake, the fire, God was not in the fire, God was not in the earthquake, God was not in the thunder, and the subjective experience is this mystery. You know, worship is emotional, but it's not emotionalism. Worship is simply my heart connecting. We like the subjective experiences. I know people who go for conferences and they buy all the tapes and they are listening to the tapes and they are going hallelujah for a week after that. They are down in the dust. Start listening to the still small voice saying, this is the way walking it. God is not against the subjective. He gives us those things once in a while. I'm reminded of Simon Peter. Remember in the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James and John 3, Jesus had a serpent. He had 12, he had 3 and he had 1. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James and John and Elijah and Moses were there and Peter said, let us stay here. Wow, we like the experience. And Jesus said, there is more work to be done down there. There is more work to be done and accomplished in the valleys of life than in the mountain tops. I love mountain tops because I'm emotional. I'm emotional. And I love the subjective experiences. But I have almost always got fresh direction through a still, small voice saying, this is the way of it. Just obedience. Just obedience. It's simple, uncomplicated. The God who speaks out of the storm can speak to you if you are willing to listen. And then finally, I want to look at God speaking to Peter. Now, Peter is the guy who puts his foot in his mouth all the time. And yet God chose to. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. On the tomorrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh up to a city, Peter went up to the house to pray about the sixth hour. And he became hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven open. And a certain vessel descending down as if it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down in the earth. Wearing God, manners of four foot of beads, great wild animals, and great animals, and bows of the earth. And there came a voice. God is speaking. Peter, kill and eat. Wow. But Peter said, Lord, I have never eaten anything that is unclean. Of common. Now Peter had seen the miracle of the conversion of the Samaritan woman who was common. But you know, hear me carefully. Some of us who come from a church background are so fixed in our theological understanding of what we think church is about that God has no freedom to move. Peter had gone back to his own Jewish way of life and thinking. It was all law 
no grace. You see, all of us have some bent, either we are legal or either we are grace. It has a balance. The Ark of the Covenant was carried by the priests on their shoulders for balance because inside that Ark was the law of Moses, that's the law, and on top of it was the mercy seat, that's grace. And the truth has to be balanced. It's not all law, all grace. It's the balance of both. And it's very often hard to find the balance depending on our brain. So Peter found it hard to shake off his legalism. It's like people who come to church and, and they are praying, Oh God, bring revival. And they are trying to determine who should come in. You and I can't define who should come in. It's God's church. It's God's kingdom. He has the final say. So Peter needed three visions in technicolor for God to get through. Not once, three times, God had to speak to him. You and I don't get to determine who comes in and who stays out. He is God. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he will do it his way, not ours. Peter's worldview was us only. People just like me. You know, you know what I'm talking about. In the mind of people, Joe, Peter, the, the servant of love was just us. Just us, it's all about us. You know, we come and hug each other and bless each other and kiss each other and go home and get the world. But we're praying. And sometimes our worldview is contrary to what we're praying for. Unclean, unsaved, unchurched. They come in, God can clean them up. We can't. In the mind of God, the circle was bigger and broader and more gracious than our circles. Our circles are narrow and confined. God's idea and understanding of the kingdom is broader. All people, not just my kind. Wow. Peter, what is acceptable to me has to be acceptable to you. You don't make that decision. Here's what I really think what was trying to break through in Peter's mind. Now remember he's going up to pray. We can pray for revival in our churches, but until, until we come into a deeper realization of whom God wants to bring into our tight circles relationally, it won't happen. the reality. It's easy to pray, but there is a responsibility on our part to adjust our worldview of how the kingdom of God operates from God's perspective, not ours. That's the problem that the twelve had with Jesus in John chapter 4. He's talking to a Samaritan woman there and you know culturally you don't do that at that time of the afternoon. And so they are thinking in their mind, they're not saying anything like some of you do, you think you don't say it. But your body language tells the story. Stay away. Let me tell you. If you stay away from people, you can't reach them. You can't. The greatest impediment to the propagation of the gospel in this universe is not the devil, it's believers. People like you and I who have no deep understanding of what it is to reach out to marginalized people, to hurting, broken, messed up 
people who don't deserve grace, but God initiates grace, so we have no say in the matter. We need to reposition our whole thinking on what grace really means. Grace means God accepts people the way they are. And if He does, we have to. No choice, no argument. So God had to speak very forceful and show Him in a vision because speaking verbally He wouldn't understand. So He gives it to Him in technical. Peter's revelation changed the church forever. And in Acts chapter 10 verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth once again. I like that. Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of person, but in every nation he that feareth him and work that righteousness is accepted. God isn't limited by the color of a skin. God isn't limited by human prejudice. The biggest impediment to the propagation of the gospel is prejudice. And we have to ask God to anesthetize our hearts so that we can take it out. We are all born with prejudice as a result of the fall. So next time when you pray, as you should, pray with the understanding that God might bring into this church some people that will make you uncomfortable. But if it's all right to God, it's all right to you. Somebody asked me, can I smoke? Yeah, I said, no problem. If you can do it outside, but if you're coming next Sunday, then I'll keep an ash there. I'll stick one on the outside of the door. I like to see the face of the ashes when they see the ash there. You think God cares whether you smoke or not? I don't think so. Your wife might care, your husband might care, if you're a woman, I don't right? But up there, no smokes. It's a smoke-free zone. If you want smokes, you have to go down. Sometimes we get the little things big and the big things little. I sometimes go and ask, have you got a lighter? <laughs> you know, and, and some guys, the automatic reaction is the reach of the lighter because they forget whom they are talking to. Oh, wow, thank you, I give it back. It doesn't bother me. It used to 30 years ago, now I don't care. Because I cannot put a measuring stick into your heart and determine your commitment to God because God looks at the heart. Just between you and Him. Isn't that right? When you and I have a deeper understanding of what grace is in our lives, then we can accommodate people are different to us. That is the gospel. Jesus, Peter is opening his mouth and he's saying, you know, I perceive, now I perceive. I see the light. I hope you see the light too and it changes your life. I hope you see the light and it changes your life. Of a truth, it's a truth that God is no respect of persons. But in every nation, the person who fears him and does righteousness is accepted. Change this thing. And Peter became one of the leaders of the New Testament church. And as we face 2019, you may be like Abraham, you need a sense of direction for your life, God can give it to you. 
God can give it to you. Like Elijah, you may be going through a season of discouragement. You need to get a new understanding, a new sense of purpose to push through your struggles. We have to push through them. You can, you can get discouraged, but don't stay discouraged. And stop speaking negatively. Negativity like the flu. You get have it, you give it to everybody else. Or number three, you can be like Peter. Maybe you need a renewed understanding of what the kingdom of God is all about. You know why churches stay small? Not because God doesn't want them to grow, but because the people in the church don't want the church to grow. That's the research that has been done across thousands of churches and that's what it has shown. We decide the church is going to stay small because we think small is beautiful. It isn't. Small might be beautiful in your eyes, but it certainly isn't in God's eyes. Simple as that. There are people who are going to come and sit next to you. And you're going to feel uncomfortable because I can see it from here. And I'll be saying hallelujah. That's the church Jesus gave you. When you and I are aware of the grace of God in our lives first, hello? When you and I are aware of the skeletons that were in our cupboard that God removed by His grace, then you can be gracious to people who need the same grace. We forget so easily where we were but for the grace of God. We now, you know, we are, we are like self-righteous Pharisees and scribes of Jesus' time. We have lost sight of grace in our lives. And God is reminding us once again. You are saved by grace. Therefore, be willing to extend that grace to somebody who is hurting, broken, dysfunctional, mess. I will clean the mess. You don't need to do it. He is God. Only He can do the cleanup. Shall we do it? Hallelujah. If God 